Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, human speech fails to give you the thanks that you deserve for the day that we celebrate today. The glories of the resurrection, the hope and the vision and the purpose and the spirit with which this day fills us. Lord, you are mighty to save and you stretched out your hands and you redeemed broken creation by bursting forth from the tomb, giving us life and hope and a future and intimacy and friendship and companionship and union with you once again. Father, we could not be reconciled to you, and yet you did the unimaginable, and you reconciled us to you through the blood of the cross and through the empty tomb. Well, we thank you for the joy of the resurrection. We pray this morning, Lord, that our hearts might be filled with this joy, but that it might send us out from this place not unchanged, but rather brought more deeply and more fully into a, an idea and a concept and a vision for what it is that you have in store for us in our lives, both in this life and in the life that is to come. Now this morning, Father, I pray that every word of my mouth would be acceptable in your sight, that the meditation of every heart in this place would be acceptable to you. For Lord, every word that we say, every song that we sing, everything that we do, we base on the foundation of you. For you are our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. There are no words more beautiful in any tongue than the announcement that God has through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ set us free from the power of sin and hell and death. And I believe these words are made all the more powerful by the long solemnity of Lent, by the sorrowful stripping of the altar from this past Thursday night, the stark brutality of Good Friday. Those days of darkness make the brightness of this day shine all the more. But today we declare that the desert is behind us, and today we gather at the feast. We crowd around to look into the empty tomb and to celebrate and revel with joy over the reality and the truth that death has been destroyed, that it is no longer the final word for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm not sure if there is a better image for the joy and the glory of this day and the pain and the suffering that God had to endure to bring us to this day than that cross that you saw our children flowering at the beginning of the service. It's been moved over here to this niche over in the gospel transept. So I encourage you as you leave today to go just stand in front of it for a minute, to revel at what it represents. I mean, here is this symbol and this sign of the most horrible thing that a human being can do to another, this symbol of human hatred and torture. And yet springing out of it are signs of life and beauty. From the cross comes the empty tomb. Out of the thing of death springs forth life. And my friends, that is beyond human comprehension. Only God could do that. And so today we say praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. But even in the light of the joy of this day, God's word presents to us a challenge on this Easter Sunday. In the midst of all of the rejoicing and the trumpets and the flowers, we hear a call. And it is this challenge, this call, that I set before you this morning. So what? We came into this church singing, Jesus Christ is risen today. But does the resurrection make a difference in your day-to-day -day life? 
Because Jesus returned from the grave not just to fix our death problem, but rather to change us utterly, to make us holy today, to transform you and me to the very bone. He came back from the grave to give us resurrection life, not just to give us a Sunday on which to celebrate. He came back to fill us with life and with purpose, to set us loose on a world that desperately needs to see the brightness of Easter Sunday every single day of the year. The world needs the news of Easter. They say that this past week there were more searches for World War III on the internet than in the history of Google. And the mother of all bombs gets dropped this week, and apparently the father of all bombs is not far behind it. We see news of naval forces amassing here and there. We have churches being bombed all throughout the world. We've got chaos and political upheaval even here in our own backyard. We sit here today as Easter people who know that the world needs the news of the empty tomb. And in our own lives, we struggle, don't we, with illness and broken relationships, with our own pride and sin and selfishness. And resurrection living can sometimes seem like only an occasional thing, maybe something reserved for Sunday mornings. But on Monday, we got to get back to real living. Well, the empty tomb asks us, Where do we find our answers to the hours that we spend during the week? Does the world see us looking for and finding our answers in the resurrection? Do we model for the world what it means to live in that light, not just today, but every day? Do they see us as people of the resurrection, full of boldness, striving for holiness, captivated not by the things of this fleeting world, but rather captivated by the joy of what the Lord has set before us. Sometimes I fear in my own life that as you encounter me day to day, I'm not any different than the rest of the world. And if we're honest, we know that in our own lives. When the chaos of human life comes crashing down on us, do we cling to that flowering cross? Or are we looking for other places for answers, which always leaves us in the same situation, cowering with fear and doubt just because we're lost without the cross and the empty grave? Are our lives resurrection directed? Or are they still like those mired in the world, self-directed, And of course, anything self-directed is directed towards death. This morning, we declare that the resurrection is true. But is it only a distant hope? Or has it changed you to the bone? Our collect of the day began our service with this challenge. So if you'll look on page 5 of your service leaflet, That collective prayer that we prayed at the beginning prayed this, that God would grant we who celebrate the joy of Easter Day might be what? We might be raised from the death of sin by God's life-giving Spirit. In other words, we pray that the joy of Easter might not be something that's fleeting, but might be something that alters us root and branch, that God's glory might not just be something that we look at and admire and and celebrate, but rather something that raises us up from the dust and sets us upright on our feet, filled with hope and purpose and vision that can only come from the God who rose again and calls us into his kingdom. I love Easter Sunday, 
No other Sunday of the year is quite as full of flowers and trumpets and celebration and flowered crosses and our best Sunday pastel colors. But it's not just about celebration. Today, my friends, is an invitation to me and to you to start living the life of the resurrected, not just tomorrow, but today. Jesus Christ is risen today. So what? So let's both sing that good news and live that good news. Today is the day of resurrection. Will you come out of your own tomb and into the life of Christ? Paul's letter to the Colossians presents this challenge as boldly as does today's collect. Paul is asking us in this reading from Colossians to ask ourselves, has the resurrection changed you? This morning's reading, which is on page 8 of your service leaflet, if you want to look at it, it's so short and yet so full of meaning. The first words of that reading are this, so if you have been raised with Christ, But an equally good way of translating that phrase would be to make it into a rhetorical question. Have you not been raised with Christ Jesus? Paul assumes that the answer to that question will be yes. So Paul then says two astounding things about you. First, Paul reminds you that If you have been raised with Christ Jesus, then you are already dead. You've already died. You've already shared in the death of Christ. That is why as resurrection people, death has lost its power and its dominion and its domination over us. Paul then says this about you. Now you are already resurrected with Jesus. You already share in his new life. The resurrection is for you if you're here today in Christ Jesus. The resurrection is already a present reality for you. That will be known in fullness in the future. But it doesn't just stand off at the edge of human history, on the distant horizon. One day I'll get there. Paul says today. Today is Easter for you. And tomorrow should be equally as full of Easter hope and Easter power. If you look to your left and your right, and you see people who are following after Jesus Christ, then you're looking at people for whom death has lost its sting, and people who have already been caught up in the power and the glory of the resurrection of Jesus. And because those two astounding things are true, Paul says that we have got to grab a hold of that reality with both hands and never let go. We have been changed. We are not like the world. So it should follow that we want to seek after the things that are of Christ. Paul uses this spatial imagery above and below, but he's asking us to say, where is the one in whom you've already shared in death and now you live in life? He is at the right hand of the Father and he has purposes for you. Those are the things that are above. And he says, do away with these things that are of the world below. The things of sin and selfishness and pride. I want you to take a minute and think about that truth. If you're here this morning and you are in Christ, then your life is being day by day, season by season, conformed to the life of Christ Jesus. So that when he is revealed on the last day, it will merely be the exclamation point to your life. Sometimes I think we can think about the return of the Lord as the thing that's going to fix everything for us. And God says to us today, I love the world today. So I am filling it with resurrected people 
so that when I do reveal myself, they will have had a foretaste of that revelation. And my friends, that foretaste is you and it is me. The person who lives according to the power of the resurrection already shares in the life of Christ. I don't know about you. When I hear those words of Paul, they cut me to the bone. And I know that I want that kind of life today. Not tomorrow, I want it today. Well, I want it tomorrow too, but I really want it today. Jesus Christ is risen, so what? So let's both sing that good news and live in that good news. Today is the day of resurrection. Will you come out of your own tomb and live in the life of Christ? Today's passage from Acts presents this same challenge, this same call, this same invitation. Will we live now as those who have already been changed by the resurrection? Now, let me make sure we're all on the same page about what's happening in these verses from Acts chapter 10. Do you remember this story? There was a Gentile man, a Roman centurion who lived in the Roman port city of Caesarea Maritima, and his name was Cornelius. And somehow Cornelius found out about the God of Israel, and he wanted to worship him. So God sends an angel to this Gentile and says, go find a Jew who's living 40 miles down the coast from you, whose name is Peter, and bring him to your house, and he'll tell you the gospel of the Jewish Messiah. And so Cornelius' men are on their way to get Peter. And do you remember what happens to Peter while the men are on the road? God brings him the weirdest vision anyone has ever had, right? He presents him this feast full of food that is unclean for a Jewish man to eat. And Peter says, Lord, I do not eat non-kosher food. And the vision ends, and Peter's bewildered. He has no idea what God must have been up to in such a confusing vision. But later, when he's brought to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius says, share with me what God has done through Israel. Tell me the gospel. Peter suddenly realizes what that vision was all about. That anyone, listen, anyone can be made clean by the power of the resurrection. Anyone can die with him and be raised with him. And Peter realizes that sharing that resurrection news with this Roman centurion is the reason why he exists in the first place. It's the purpose of God's church. So finally, that brings us to today's passage where we hear what we tend to call the sermon of Peter in Cornelius' house. But I got to tell you that I don't really think this was a sermon, unless it was a sermon that Peter was preaching to himself. And as a preacher, I got to tell you that happens more often than you might think. Peter, I think, was verbally processing what was happening before his eyes. He was sitting there thinking, God is like this. This is Peter's aha moment. The God of the Israelites has risen from the dead in order to save not just me and my people, but the whole world. And now that I think about it, that's what Jesus was always talking about. From his baptism, to his healing, to his death and resurrection, it was always so that someone like this centurion standing in front of me might know forgiveness, might know resurrection life. So Peter looks up and says, I just learned the gospel in a whole new way. And do you remember how the story ends? The Holy Spirit comes swooping into the room and changes the lives of every Jew and Gentile gathered in that place. Do you know what that kind of aha moment feels like? A few weeks ago, I noticed that a member of our parish, David Reese, suddenly looked very different to me. And for the life of me, my little brain could not figure out what it was about him that was so weird. 
So we were here on a Wednesday night dinner, and I walked up to David, and I said, David, did you get Lasix? And he said, he looked at me like I lost my mind, and he said, excuse me? And I said, David, you look so different without your glasses. And he said, Father Andrew, I don't wear glasses. <laughs> and it was an awkward moment. And I must have looked very perplexed until David suddenly burst out laughing. And he says, Father Andrew, are you trying to figure out why I look so weird? I shaved off my beard, man. <laughs> I, I know I couldn't have felt any stupider in that moment. I mean, it was right there in front of my face, or it was rather right there not on David's face. And I didn't see it until I saw it. That's Peter today. Now I get it. It was right there in front of me all along. This new life in Christ Jesus, the sharing in his death, sharing in his resurrection, it's the gift that changes the world. Not just in the past, not just today, but every day that the Lord blesses me with. Is that aha moment in front of me today? Is that aha moment presented to you today? Maybe you're here this morning and you believe in the resurrection, but you've been living life for far too long, robbed of its power. My friends, today is the day of salvation. God wants to plant in you holiness, godliness, fearlessness, boldness for the sake of his good news. Jesus Christ is risen today. Today is the day of resurrection. Will you let this day be the day that you come out of the tomb and into the light and life of Christ Jesus? I love the flowered cross that stands over in the gospel transept today. It's a symbol of a much more beautiful reality. For you are the flowered cross that God has sent into the world. I am the flowered cross that God has sent into the world because if I share, if you share in the death of the cross, then you and I share in the resurrection and new life is waiting to burst forth from our lives. May it do so for you and me today, to his glory and by his grace. Amen.